Sorry, did I offend you? Sorry, no, just kidding. Uh, so the power of positive that pervades everything. Um, and our goal is with this enthusiasm and positive spirit to make you uh, the best spine surgeons on the planet, optimize any potential that you have, execute perfectly every patient every time. Uh, there's an NHS um, initiative that one of our good friends, uh, Mike Hutton, runs. It's called Getting It Right the First Time. They actually use it as a metric. And that's a really important aspect as you apply it to spine with significant philosophical insights. Uh, I have three basic mantras when I look at procedures and the technologies that are around. I like efficiency, I like precision, and it's all fueled by compassion. That's my personal spine mantra. And I realize, and congratulations on this also, that spine is probably next to cranial neurosurgery and maybe some aspects of CT surgery, Patrick, what do you think is the most unforgiving specialty out there? I mean, the the abyss that we just saw um, is so close on every single front and every little detail counts. And uh, that certainly is uh, correct. And I think Murphy's Law applies very much and was probably written about uh, spine and with spine care in mind. And the damages uh, can be profound. And another personal uh, revelation, I love essentialism. Um, as you're going to be bombarded by industry, and industry is our friend, industry is important, you'll be asked to use more and more stuff, this technology, that stuff. I don't like clutter. I like things that work, and I follow my mantra of efficiency and precision. And if it's not very clear that this is, makes something clearly better for me, then I prefer to not have it. So again, coagulation, I'm not going to use product names here, augmentation devices or hypersonic scalpels. I've used those. I just don't get it. Uh, personally, I want to turn you into us. First, I want to uh, turn you into a spine seal, and I will give you a couple of my favorite spine seal quotes. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Uh, for instance, now in the beginning of the year, nobody this year has done it, but I always am just interested in seeing how people use the Midas, which do I, I use for my decompressions mainly. And they are the terror twisters and they're the, the sucker tornado people and everything like that. And I like uh, measured Zen sucking and I like uh, precise um, application of force. And I don't like all this stuff going on. There's my age. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but I, you've seen it also. I mean, the, the variety of how people use their tools and even a sucker tip is just amazing. So just calming down and uh, knowing that everything counts that you're doing is such a big deal because you're going to create great things. But again, nothing is trivial and every step, every stone counts. And again, this is what the purpose of this talk about Ten Commandments is. They're not real commandments and you may think that some of these things are trivial, but they're born out of realizations that everything counts and everything that we do may backfire if we don't do it right. So the number 10 is just very convenient and this is why I chose it. And these are hence the 10 spine commandments. And again, you may think that some of these things are really marginal, but believe us me, these are born and collected in my mind, in my heart, in my complication rep uh, repository as negative experiences. And somebody who you may rec uh, recognize in this picture said, it isn't the mountains ahead that to climb that wear you out, it's the pebble in your shoe. A great picture by the late, great Muhammad Ali. So I'm, I have a couple of idols, and again, there are multiple here in this room. I'm not going to enumerate them, so uh, cool to be here with you guys. Um, uh, but uh, I love Professor Majid Sami. Uh, Rod got me into personal contact with him, and the late uh, John Jane, who was a frequent visitor at UW. But Dave Skaggs is one of those people also. And these people have a remarkable calmness. Uh, Majid Sami is how old now? 87? 84. 84. 84. And he does the most complex skull based surgeries in Hanover, Germany. And he is calm. And it's a very cool atmosphere in his room. And uh, yes, it's a surgeon controlled hospital, by the way. Uh, but um, uh, it's a very productive uh, atmosphere. I think Dr. Skaggs would appreciate that. Um, so here's another Navy SEALs quote. So I hope you find uh, uh, meaning in that. Let's wake up and find your mission. So the secret to success is very clear, being calm, collected, but also find your mission, find your credo. So here come the Ten Commandments, and they've been refined a little bit over the years. But rule one is so obvious, but only operate on the right patient, right time, right location, on the right 
that's the correct side. Do not perform columbus surgery and explore around the spine. I have to credit uh, MIS and uh, navigation and robotic medicine with having introduced a far more precise pre-planning. We've always done it with a simple paper and arrows. Uh, this is not one um, that we tape to the bovi. Uh, but you should be absolutely clear and always remember we do great things in spine if we decompress compromised neural elements safely, if we stabilize compromised structures and hopefully get an orthodesis, and if we realign the spine. Ortho joke, we call something ORF, open reduction internal fixation, if we get the alignment right. The other version is OIF, that's open internal fixation, which I see a lot with, sorry, minimally invasive surgery, where hardware is thrown into patients for reasons I'm not completely clear about, but there's clearly no realignment. So those are the three foundations with which we do very well, and this all leads to uh, preparation. Positioning should be no compromises. It's crazy how often I see bad things, and again, I've had three patients in my life who've had perioperative blindness, pion, anybody else have that? Yeah, it's, it's brutal. It's just... Uh, talking about complications, it's just, and probably it's when the head's too low or in this prolonged hypotension and there's inadequate resuscitation. It's not direct eye pressure, so pion is horrible, but uh, head should be above the heart, the eyes should be above the heart level. Um, and again, every single pressure point uh, has to be a problem. The patient should be orthogonal. Again, in the MIS era, there's far more precise positioning nowadays than we had in the past. Uh, but especially for the EKG leads in your MIS era, you don't want to have those over your targeted field because there is a guaranteed likelihood that something will break or something will happen right where that EKG lead is. So make sure they're not in there. Now, this is a real triviality, but I can't tell you how often I had that in the past. Don't drape yourself out. You're instrumenting to the upper thoracic spine. How far do you drape? The head. <laughs> The head, you drape to the head. You don't drape to T1 because under guarantee, you're going to have to use a sentence calling, a saying to Dr. Johnson, it's prepped underneath. I don't want to ever hear that. Not cool. <laughs> Clear, dry, precise exposure. Again, don't explore around. No Columbus surgery. You know where you're going. From the MIS era, and by the way, fellows unearthed a 25-year-old video of me exposing the virtues of a so-called metrics tube. So I used to do those things, and I went away from them. But the, the benefit there was we had a very precise access uh, technology. I nowadays use that with a cob, and I take one shot. But I want to know where we're going very early on. I don't want to explore around L3-4 when I'm going to L5-S1, which happens uh, frequently. Uh, know about the relaxation, less blood loss, better start, preserve all the ligaments, adjacent segments. I love what Kojo said about not going into the rostral area and preserving those, and then doing a very smart, careful dissection on the top end so that you preserve the, the osteoligamentous structures and the muscles as much as possible. Dural tears, uh, Liz talked about it. No intended, unintended dural invasions. I mean, this is just a downer. It's all solvable usually, but uh, and it happens, but uh, it just clearly is a, in my opinion, a complication. Who thinks it's not a complication? Unintended dural tears. We agree, right? I mean, it's a complication. It takes an hour extra, half an hour extra, and there's just a change in perspective in terms of how things happen and evolve. Then this is one of my other pet peeves. I don't like cable messes and mishmash floating around, spaghettis floating around. I actually ask my surgical techs to keep things uh, clean and sterile and also keep the cables untangled because if you tangle cables, guess what's going to happen? They're going to fall. And I do not like falling equipment. I used to work in a level one trauma center in the near proximity that if you dropped your uh, Midas, Good luck getting another one. This would be this would be a problem. Yeah. Uh, is that from Kojo's case? <laughs> yeah, I know there's uh, that looks like there's a sonic scalpel in there. There's uh, an ultrasound in there. There's uh, I, don't know. I mean, we have so much stuff already. And this is where I come into my essentialism thing. You want to keep the cables clean and really think about how much do you absolutely need for your surgery uh, and keep them nice and organized. Number seven, again, um, <clears throat> no retained foreign bodies. You've done one of those mega cases, uh, Dr. Abdul-Jabbar just showed that, and uh, uh, Turner and uh, Kirsten, mega cases. And what do you not want to hear from your nursing staff as the closure is occurring? We're missing a cottonoid. This is just like, no. <laughs> so this actually literally does not happen. 
if you have the rule that the cottonoids belong in the patient or on the Mayo stand, nowhere else. You don't want to drop them anywhere. And if you drop them somewhere on the patient's uh, surface, ask somebody to put them back in there. Sponges, same thing. Keep a sponge count going and involve your team. Dr. Skaggs' talk is so cool. Involve your team. Make everybody help you uh, help the patient. So uh, that actually goes a long ways. And again, that just avoids frustrations to a large degree. This generation is way too young to know who Paul Simon was, but in our era, this was a great thing. And we used to, in the past, play the soundtrack for this. No slipping and sliding, no plunging. Do understand the power dynamics of the tools you use. The Midas, for instance, or whatever tool you use, turns on and turns off. One millimeter off bone. Uh, you're not doing crazy stuff. And again, carrettes are cutting tools. Uh, you should know why you're using them, how you're using them. And um, this is so, uh, so pertinent to subsiding away. The nearer you're to your destination, the more you're subsiding away. Uh, again, that one slip, this can turn everything around. Talking about that, two hands for power tools, uh, very clearly. So uh, big things like pedicle finders. When I see um, a, a trainee uh, take two hands onto a pedicle finder and push hard, that's a problem. It's way more controlled to use a, a tamp or something like that. And same for correts and cobs. Uh, be aware that these things can really uh, take a dynamic out of themselves. And again, vascular injuries, et cetera, can happen. Ultimately, you want to take pride in what you do. You want to be really proud of this, and appearances do matter. So uh, people uh, like uh, looking at the x-rays. I actually print them out in my office. My name is on there conveniently, and I give them that. And I've heard from many people, they've come to me because the x-rays actually look nice. By the way, I do it for my decompressions also. I put little probes into the decompression zone. I use that as a uh, visual documentation that was at the correct level. But I also print it out for the patient so they see I did this. And I did it a side specific for instance, for microdiscectomies, right and left, an AP is added to that. Appearances do matter, and having an aesthetically, and I learned that from Chris Chaffee, pleasant x-ray is the best thing for everybody. So we saw great looking x-rays today, but this is also your best business card, uh, frankly. So and I'm still not sure whether we actually help patients when we put, uh, perforate them with 20 screw holes up and down their spine. Not so sure about the aesthetics and the muscle physiology below that, but I'll leave that topic for another discussion. Ultimately, and this goes into Liz's lecture, this is actually a great juxtaposition. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Kojo. Thank you, Rod. Don't harm. Don't harm the patient. Don't harm anybody. So um, uh, don't harm yourself. This is a really big deal. Um, um, we are here to help people. And again, we have vulnerable patients, but also in terms of cuts, this is, goes into David's talk. When we pass sharps, we always put the blunt side back towards the scrub tech and we announce it sharp. Anybody watch the TV show Bear? Kitchen talk. Have a clear. The first show was very traumatic for me because as a as a high school student, my dad forced me to work in a commercial a commercial kitchen for two summers, and I knew one thing: I'm never, ever, ever going to do this for a living. It was that bad. But that first show, the first episode, anybody see that? Very terrifying, and I had total PTSD. But there's a good news in there because they actually use, especially in the later shows, very precise command language so that everybody says, and they say chef to everybody. Sometimes there's passive aggression in there. But they do have very clear, precise terms. Dave uh, talked about x-ray commands. So having very simple things like sharp, sharp, or hot tip, or something like that helps a lot. So the priorities, again, actually the patient care, but also you and your loved ones. And self-care is a really big deal. And this is where I end. This is the four H's, the head, heart, hands, and the harmony. The harmony that you create in the OR. And of course, as we're in this navigation area, uh, this guy, Yusuf Dikech, is a hero of mine. <coughs> I wonder why. Uh, but I, I don't have all those gadgets. Yes, I wear 3.5 loops. But I mean, having this calm confidence and next year he's going to, next time he's going to win the gold, he said. By the way, does anybody know why he picked up uh, shooting? No. He got divorced. And so he started picking up shooting. And then he, in this interview, said, I thank my ex-wife. <laughs> And whenever I see, and this is one of my mantra books, Daniel Pink's Drive, uh, creating a flow state. When you do highly repetitive things, creating a workflow that has very simple, clear uh, uh, communications is super important. And I swear, uh, this could be Dave Skaggs writing this. <laughs> and here's my final uh, spine seal quote, and that is two is one and one is none. And that's, with that, I end. Thank you. <laughs> And because I'm too old for this, 
we have our great young mind with uh, Philip Louis. Hey. End up the lectures. Yeah, yeah sorry, Rod. I have a quick comment and question. Um, you know, it's been really awesome working with you. And, um, you know, one thing that I picked up from you, which I never had before, is, and maybe you can talk about this, is that you really have proceduralized, like, you know, for example, even our decompressions, you know, we wrote a paper on, we call it the ABCDs of spinal decompression. But everything you do, and I think this goes back to maybe working in that kitchen in that summer, is you basically, like, all your cuts, you know, how you do everything, like, you just do it the same way every time. Can you just kind of talk about, um, because I think it's important, and I think, you know, and I, I love the ten, ten Commandments, but um, I think it's something that you just always have done, but you kind of take it for granted. You know, as a neurosurgeon, you know, we would just get a, I remember when I was a resident with Charlie and I, with Dr. Jane, you know, and we just said, okay, we're doing a laminectomy, and every time it would be like a different way we would do it. <laughs> you know? And we got the job done, but I love the fact that it's with, if you're doing a laminectomy, it's like you're doing either a J cut, a U cut, or, you know, like there's a method to the madness. Can you just kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so you give me way too much credit, but I try to do things mm -hmm. uh, very systematically from analysis that in a way this is uh, reflected in this talk. But I like precision, I like efficiency. I don't like the futz around. I want to clean up one level and decompress it really well and be sure that I've uh, cleaned up everything um, and not come back to that and um, not have destroyed anything that uh, deserves uh, uh, presence. Uh, going back, I've done this now, well, over 35 years now, as an attending, I saw how disorganized people are when they just do a decompression, a simple decompression, without any regard to the patient's anatomy and uh, how they don't localize properly with, uh, for me, the thoracolumbar spine has one, whether you're MIS or not, one key uh, point that you have to identify, and that's the PARS. If you put a probe over the PARS, by the way, you'll never have a wrong level surgery. And you, by the way, have your boundary of where your upper decompression could remotely go. You know where the exiting route is. So just a hint, sublaminous spinous process doesn't go. I was just always perturbed how people would just go into the spine and rip out the spinous processes and rip out whatever and at a fusion destroy the spinous process for the next upper level. So just being cognizant of what you're doing and being efficient and precise, being mindful and purposeful in what you're doing works a lot. And just falling into the flow state. Again, Dave Skaggs uh, was probably, uh, Pink, Daniel Pink just imitated you, I think. But like when you drill with an MR8 drill tip, you use a nine sucker. And Charlie and I disagree on this. He's a dry driller. I'm a moist driller. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's a detail. But you have a size match sucker tip, of course. Uh, so, so you're just cognizant of what you're doing. And again, this uh, I never thought this would get published, but JNS published this, which was kind of cool. The ABCs of spinal decompression, it makes you actually way more efficient and go back to the first mantra of the SEALs. Um, uh, slow, uh, uh, slow is smooth and uh, smooth is fast. Um, it's, it's really true. Once you have a clear purpose and you know where your boundaries are and you execute that, it goes very well. So uh, give me way too much credit because guess what? I also learn all the time. I learn from the next group of fellows and I learn from my colleagues all the time. So I'm not done. And this is a great segue, but thank you for the question. <laughs>